Okay, I <coughs> some years ago, I remember um, sort of thinking about these these books. I I had no intention of writing a book at that time, but there was this book, The White Lie, by Walter Ray and uh, Ron Numbers, Prophetess of Health. And I thought, okay, I'm going to read those just to set us on myself as what they have to say. We don't need they they claim to have you know all this wonderful stuff. We don't need to worry about what they've got. Just analyze it and see what they've got. So I did. I went through it, <coughs> and I um, I realized they didn't have the answers that they thought they had. And so I went to uh, a fellow who was in charge of the Ellen White. Uh, what is it? I don't know. Thing here in the library, Ellen White Center. Yeah, and I I told him about this, and I said, you know, I have uh, I, I described what I thought needed the kind of research that needed to be done to do what Ron Numbers didn't do. And he said, well, that's just been done. So he put me in touch with this physician from Australia, Don McMahon. And so we got together and ended up with a, with a book. And so my part is the first part, <coughs> looking at these books and analyzing them. Then his part is some new research that, that he did. Very interesting. Um, first of all, <coughs> Let's just ask a big question. Is it legitimate to question a prophet? Do we have the right to do that? Well, here's what it says in the Bible. Test all prophets. Hold to what is true. That's in Thessalonians. And <coughs> so we, we, we have the right to question. We, we need to decide. There are a lot, a lot of people claiming to be prophets. Okay, who knows what they're talking about? And then, of course, the critic of a prophet needs to be held to the same standard. Um, they can't get away with sloppy stuff if they're not going to let the prophet get away with sloppy stuff. Okay, so we need to be careful of our logic on both sides. <coughs> so here's what I'm going to talk about. <coughs> um, research design and logic, how you can talk about these questions. Walter Ray, The White Lie, uh, Ron Numbers, Process of His Health, and, uh, and then some new research. There's a, another item that actually is in the book that I'm not going to cover, just I think for lack of time, and that is an article by Jonathan Butler some years ago uh, criticizing Ellen White. Okay, research design, what does that mean? <coughs> uh, experimental design is the same concept, but uh, if you're not doing, these guys are not doing experiments, they're doing research, but this, the design concepts, how you answer questions uh, is very much the same. So. Can the data you're collecting answer the question that you're trying to ask, you're trying to answer? And so were their data collected by an objective uh, plan? And is their logic valid? Okay, so that was the kind of questions I was asking. If the research design is faulty, science can be a way of going wrong with confidence. And I've seen this many times. Mm -hmm. You start with the wrong assumption, you start with the wrong logic, and you, you, you confidently go off into, into hinterland. So I'm going to use an, an, an example. <coughs> I'm going to use a little friend of mine for this example. Um, in, insects have their ears on different parts of their body. We, we think we know where ears belong. But insects have ears on their legs, on their antennae, uh, you know, very, on their body, various places. So, so I have a, a trained flea. Okay, here he is. Herman, I trained him to jump. Okay, Herman, jump. Okay, and he jumps. He's good at jumping. Now I want to know where his ears are. Can he, you know, that he can hear me with? And so, so I think, okay, maybe they're on the antennae. <coughs> so we'll take off his antennae. All right. Now Herman, jump. Oh, he jumps. So obviously his ears are not on his antennae because he can still hear me. All right, let's see. Maybe they're on his front legs. So we'll very carefully take off his front legs. Now, Herman, jump. Oh, he jumps. Well, where else could they be? His back legs. So take off his back legs. Now, Herman, jump. He can't hear now. He can't, doesn't jump. <laughs> OK. Um, do you buy my logic? Okay, there's one basic problem. 
even though it's, it's a bizarre example, there's one basic problem that can apply in many kinds of research. I, I thought I was asking where are his ears. What I really, my data could only tell me, can he jump without his back legs? <laughs> okay, so the, I tried to ask one question, my data answered a different question. And that, uh, it can be a very real problem in sophisticated research if it's you know, more dealing with more complicated things that it's not so easy to spot those errors. So where are the flea's ears located? Well, the really question answered, can they jump without their back legs? Beware of answering different questions than the one being asked. Because that can lead you astray. And there are, there are, this is just one example of a number of kinds of errors you can make in logic that can lead you astray. And you, so you do not answer the question you thought you were answering for various reasons. And then we have to think about a, a world view, a set of assumptions that determine many things, how we view the world. And these worldview is something that answers questions like where do we come from, why are we here, where are we going, and a lot of other things in between. And everybody has a worldview, whether they know it or not. <coughs> They're all the worldviews are based on, ultimately, on one or two assumptions that we take by faith. Christian worldview, the naturalistic worldview, they're all taken, the assumptions are always taken on faith. <coughs> and that can influence your research. <coughs> okay, Ron Numbers, he says, at the, in the, I think in the introduction to this book, he says, I have tried to be as objective as possible. Thus, I have refrained from using divine inspiration as an historical explanation. Okay, he, there he's describing his worldview. You, you, you never consider the possibility of divine inspiration if you're going to be objective. Uh, is that true or is that not? Well, his worldview, that's true of his worldview, but not necessarily for everybody else's worldview. So he has already started down a, a, a particular road, and it limits what conclusions he could come up with. <coughs> Walter Ray. Um, one of our people here, Dan, know, knew him years back, seems to corroborate what I've heard about Ray. He was a very sincere, committed Adventist Christian, uh, totally committed to Ellen White, I mean, to, to the point where he thought that everything she wrote was word for word inspired. Everything was original, word for word original, etc. And when he found out evidence that that wasn't quite right, he just threw it all away. And uh, <clears throat> so he jumped from one extreme worldview to another. And that limits what he's able to ever see as he reads those books. <clears throat> Some of the primary issues, borrowing. This is one of the big things, borrowing content from other authors. Did she really, how much of that did she do? Did she receive information by inspiration? And did she have new, accurate information on healthful living? Okay, there are other issues sprinkled in, but these are the, some of the basic things she's been criticized for. So we'll look first at Walter Ray. <coughs> now, reading this book, I found that I had to work on taking him seriously and trying to be objective. Uh, the venom, the venom against Ellen White drips from the pages. And so that's why I found it, you know, had to work at trying to take him seriously and, and look, take it serious and be objective. But anyway, Here's what I came up with. He, his main point is the implications of borrowing. <coughs> Did Ellen White use the wording from other publications? And this is what surprised him when he found that she does. She's, um, she read widely. She read other books by other people who talked about the same subjects she did. And you'll find some similar wording. OK, how much copying did she do from these other sources? Walter Ray's conclusion, she copied her material, almost, you know, he implies kind of wholesale copying from, other, from others. Therefore, he concludes, she did not receive it by divine inspiration. But are there other options to consider? Is it only one, is it only those two options? Or are there other options we need to, to think about? Um, <coughs> when I work with my students, um, thinking about how you evaluate something you're reading or how you devise your, your research. And um, I advocate the method of multiple working hypotheses. 
If we come up with a hypothesis that we think is wonderful, that becomes often our pet hypothesis. And we have a hard time seeing beyond that. And so there's a paper by a geologist that uh, it was a, a classic paper that advocates you, you think of all the possible hypotheses you can. And that get, keeps you from being too stuck on your, what might be your favorite. And you evaluate those. And so for talk, thinking about her writings, uh, here's one hypothesis. All her writings were verbally inspired and original. This was apparently Walter Ray's view at the beginning. Hypothesis two, not verbally inspired, but the prophet used her own words, um, but all was original and not from any human source. Okay, that's another one. Number three, God gave her concepts and ideas, actual content. She expressed these in her own words, and other sources helped her to express what she wanted to say, but I had a hard time saying adequately. Fourth, not divinely inspired, was copied from human sources. <coughs> okay, Walter A. apparently jumped from number, from uh, number one to number four. Okay, so is that, is that valid? Well, let's look at his information. Um, he has exhibits, 153 pages in this book are exhibits. In other words, material that she wrote compared with material from other books that she is known to have read. Um, and what we find is you, the first three exhibits he gives, they're, they're, all, they're almost word for word. Uh, okay, so what are they? Well, one is a description uh, of um, the Walden Seas, just, just a descriptive material. Um, one is something that her husband wrote, and I forget the topic right offhand. Another one is description of the mountains that she was traveling through. Okay, so if it was all like that, you know, we'd, we'd have a, some serious questions. But when you get past those first three, the picture changes considerably. <coughs> Here's some examples. Um, he has taken material from uh, Prophets and Kings and then a com a, another book, Night Scenes in the Bible, which covers the same material. Now these, the, clearly she is often kind of following the same trend, following the sequence of ideas, which isn't totally surprising because both these books are, are uh, sort of commentary on the Bible and they're going you know, verse for verse down. So it's not surprising we have a similarity uh, of arrangement of topics. But there are, then there are some places where some of the words are, are very similar. Uh, the, the false priests, the priests of Baal, uh, lay on the, you know, it's a little hard to read that exactly, lay on uh, the ground and, and on the wood. wood and the victims. Okay, taking the wood. So you have some similar words scattered through here. And so it looks like there's, there's quite a bit of similarity. <coughs> but analyzing his, what he's got here, I noticed one thing that, that's interesting. Here you have, uh, he has um, page, the pages that this is found on. And uh, this one's not so striking, but in, in many places, like here, there's one page, here you go uh, three pages, four pages down from there, and so on. He, he's collecting paragraphs or parts of paragraphs from a number of pages and putting them together here. And it looks impressive. But when you go back and read the original material, <coughs> Prophets and Kings, um, okay, you have, you have two pages here, and there's, um, I don't have room to put the other book beside it, but this, this is where the similarities are, some similarities in wording. Okay, so when you look at the whole thing, it's not nearly that impressive. It's a pretty small percentage that's, that is similar, and it's not a, a copy, it's similar, like a paraphrase. <coughs> so that's one problem with his exhibits. They really give a wrong impression because he's not giving you all the data. He's selecting what seems to, f to fit his interpretation. And here's some more. It's a, this is the, what he writes in his book. <coughs> this is the actual thing. I'll, maybe that's the same, same slide. Um, so you go through his book, and uh, 
in, in this book, I've, I have a number of pages of those comparisons. You can see it directly. <coughs> and so it's, it's not nearly as impressive as he tries to make it sound. <coughs> okay, so we can look, remember those four hypotheses. So we could say at least by now, Walter Ray's data refute hypothesis one and two, that it was word for word in, uh, inspiration. Uh, and it was all original. Okay, so has he validated, has he demonstrated his point that there's no inspiration? Actually, <coughs> um, you'd have to refute um, hypothesis three in order, you, in, in order before you could say that there's no inspiration, um, before you jump to hypothesis four. And hypothesis three is actually a description of how she said she worked. It was her description. It's a, a very, I have it here, it's a very quick summary of her description of how she worked. And why did he never discuss that? Why is it never mentioned in this book? Uh, that's a, a question I think Walter Ray needs to answer. Uh, he direct, goes directly to hypothesis four. Well, obviously there's no divine inspiration. And so you can't do that if you're doing research. You can't do that. I read these books as I would read a, a student's thesis that he's given to me, okay? Is this guy worthy of a degree? That's, that's my approach. Um, and uh, if, if this thesis was given to a committee of careful scholars, would they award this guy a degree? And I'd have to say, no, there's no way. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't understand research or how to think about it. <coughs> Evidence of copying presented by Ray and others is, is consistent with the hypothesis three, and thus is not capable of distinguishing between hypothesis three and four. It does not have the ability to do that. The data are simply not there. <coughs> they, both um, Ray and Numbers and others, have a lot to say about Ellen White's human qualities, mistakes in her personal life. They really dig into her personal life and. You know, she was human, she made mistakes. She had trouble following her own advice on, on healthful living. She was, had a very strong appetite for meat and she struggled with that for years. Okay, is that evidence against inspiration? They, they imply, you know, don't, maybe don't say it directly, but they definitely imply that that's the case. Uh, how could this woman be a prophet? Okay, <coughs> think about this question. God's spokespersons from the Bible or from the modern world, do they suddenly become perfect in their personal life? You don't, you don't think so. Well, here's one suggestion. Ask Bathsheba about that. Um, no, they, they're not. And, and do we have reason to think they should be? We might like them to be. Do we have any reason to think they should be? Um, do they suddenly become perfect? In their private lives? Do they still write personal correspondence that is not inspired? And some of these critics have taken personal letters of hers and, and shown that they have say things that are not right. Well, does God help dictate her letters? Or is she, does do this some other way? Will they always perfectly be perfectly successful in following all the good advice they give? Well, it seems obvious they, they don't. <coughs> So what does that tell us? Again, we can look at the multiple hypothesis approach. Hypothesis one, everything a prophet writes is inspired, even in personal correspondence. They never have incorrect ideas, even in private life. Number two, prophets are human with imperfect private lives. God educates them and this gradually affects their private lives as well. They gradually grow like the rest of us do. The Holy Spirit somehow supervises selection and preservation of inspired material. <coughs> Hypothesis three, since so-called prophets are not perfect, they are not inspired. Okay, so if you find that number one is not right, do we jump to number three? No, you've got to consider all the possibilities and there might be others that we could put in here. And, and look, be sure you're, you're evaluating what you think you're evaluating. And they don't do this. <coughs> Okay, so there's, there's a lot more I could say about Walter Ray, but it would take us all day. Um, but he, he, 
brings up two primary objections that some other people bring to what he is saying. So they're saying, Walter Ray, you're not really right for these reasons. And now he's trying to answer those objections. And so <coughs> um, objection number one, Walt, Ellen White wrote what she had seen in vision. She used the wording sometimes of others simply to aid her in saying what she did not have the ability to say. Okay, that's one of the objections to what Walter Ray is saying. And so what does he do in response? <coughs> Um, and he, and, and this is very clear, this is what he's doing. This is what he thinks he's doing. He's answering that objection. Ellen White used some material in her books that was written by James White. Okay, and he feels this, this blows the whole idea of inspiration. All right, is that, does that really do that? Walter Ray thought he was answering this question. Did Ellen White have divine guidance in selection of material? What he really, what he really uh, answered is, did James White ever write anything of sufficient quality that Ellen White could use it? Now, they lived together. They were together all the time. Certainly, they talked about a lot of things. It wouldn't be too surprising if he wrote some things that were consistent with what she thought. <coughs> well, so his, object, his answer to that objection doesn't hold any, any water at all. He really did not address the objection. And the objection, of course, was that, well, you can't say, Walter Ray, that, that she's not inspired just because she lets other people help her express it. What she and his answer to that it, it doesn't work. It doesn't answer the objection, the objection to Walter Ray's arguments. The next one, and this is quite interesting, there were those, and, and some of the people who, who are saying this one are not necessarily strong supporters of Ellen White. But they're recognizing something. The quality of her writing and the power of its spiritual message confirm the ro role of the Holy Spirit in the inspiration of this material. You can't just throw it out because there's just too, too uh, much of a deep quality, spiritual and, and uh, whatever, in the, her writing. You can't just throw it out. Well, he says this is the strongest plank in the argument for Ellen White. But so then he's going to answer that plank. And, um, and show that this objection is not real. And so what does he do? Well, he doesn't answer it. He, he writes, there's a page or two there, which he rambles through a lot of things about how the church has been criticized, has treated people wrong, and one thing or another, and, and um, um, you know, there's dogmatism in the church. He never, he never once addresses this. He just rambles. I don't know if he thought he had answered it or if he thought that, that we would think he answered it. I don't know what he was thinking. But it has, his answer has nothing to do with the actual objection. And so this, this stands um, unchallenged by Walter Ray. <coughs> so what did Walter Ray accomplish? Well, his evidence indicates Ellen White did, did use some wording from other authors. And we've known that for a long time. His evidence refutes verbal inspiration. He does show that. His evidence is actually consistent with Ellen White's own description of how she worked. It does not weaken her claim of divine inspiration at all. So uh, he strongly implies that his research does refute her inspiration, but his implication of that is not supported by what he, by what he brings. Um, in this book, uh, we also go through talk about other people who have written on the same topic, trying to answer the same objections and compare those. But I'm not going into those um, today. Evidence of borrowing does not have the potential to refute inspiration. Does not even have the potential. Um, if it was you know, totally copied, sure, you, you'd wonder. But, but just because she has some similar wording, that does not even have the potential to refute inspiration. Some other type of evidence is, is needed. <coughs> and there have been others who have done studies on this. Uh, for instance, um, Veltman, Fred Veltman from, from PUC was at that time at least. He did a study on, I think it was a, um, um, Steps to Christ. Okay, I, I, I remember I was present when he gave his first public presentation of, of the 
of the results that he'd got. And uh, his conclusion was a small percent, 30 percent or less, of sentences show some influence. He had uh, a number, a scale, different levels of influence from, well, a word or two similar down to complete copy. And a th uh, 30 percent of her sentences show some, some level of that kind of similarity. Um, it might be just you know, simple, very slight similarity. But okay, so 70 percent of the sentences, he couldn't find any similarity. 30 percent, he did. On the average, he described it as a, a loose paraphrase of parts uh, of those um, sections that he studied. So there is some similarity. Uh, he also described how she obviously is not just, just randomly copying. He, he describes some places where she'd be following sort of the, the wording and the thinking of this other author until it came to a place where he went off in a, what we would think is a strange direction. She would go off on her own. She didn't, didn't follow him at all. So she clearly was thinking for herself and had some, some source for understanding what to accept and what not to accept from that. <clears throat> okay, what would it take to test the hypothesis of divine inspiration? Um, well, we come back to the Bible. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message that the Lord has not spoken. So this one we have to kind of wait until time plays out. Will her predictions of end time events come true? Um, well, we can't know that for sure yet. We can certainly see the trends happening around us in the world. And, um, and uh, you know, my, my, one of my nephews, who hasn't really taken religion too seriously most of his life, but recently he said he went back and read a paper that he wrote in Academy, in Adventist Academy, uh, talk about things that are going to happen at end times in, in, the in the world situation. And recently he went back and read that, and he said, the, Everything I see around me, and he's done a lot of analysis of what, his own analysis of what's going on. He says, everything that I wrote in that paper back in Academy is, is true today. So, you know, we can see what direction things are going. What is the influence of careful, thoughtful study of her writings on people's lives? This needs to be considered. Has her leadership produced thriving system of education, medical work, etc.? Well, here we are at La Melinda. Did she make correct statements about health principles? So, so these kind of things one can look at carefully and get kind of a picture of uh, whether or not she's on the right track. She knows what she's talking about. And the one article that, I, that I'm not going to comment on <coughs> by uh, Jonathan Butler, he, he tried to claim in that article on Spectrum that her, her predictions about end time events are obviously wrong. He, he went through the newspapers of her day, and he showed how things like spiritualism, Sunday laws, were very prominent at that time. So he said, well, obviously those did not lead to the second coming. And so therefore, we have prophetic disconfirmation, that's what he said. And he, one of the points he made was, uh, you know, if she really knew what she was talking about, she would have put communism in there as one of the, 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 the beasts of Revelation. Um, so I thought to myself, okay, we'll just wait and see. At that time, Catholic Church was not, have, was not very prominent. Communism was at its peak. And I thought to myself, we'll, we'll see who's the false prophet, Butler or Ellen White. Of course, we know now, con communism, we'd look pretty foolish if we'd said communism was one of the, the beasts of Revelation 13. <clears throat> but what he did, exactly what he accused her of. He wrote the newspapers today, and he drew his conclusions from the, what the newspapers say today. Uh, she, she really didn't, because there, there is a particularly one statement in uh, Great Controversy, right in the midst of talking about all these end time events, she makes a statement, many of these things uh, that she was writing about look, look like they would be impossible. But when the spirit of good God is withdrawn from the earth, strange things will happen. So she did not see her predictions as fitting very well with what was going on in the wor world at that time. <coughs> Okay, Ron Numbers, prophetess of health. I knew Ron Numbers fairly well when he was here at Loma Linda during the time before and during he was doing this research. Um, he was, um, I've never seen anybody so vehemently 
um, against and sort of angry at Ellen White and that any, all the church's writings, he put them in a very low category, the whole works. Um, he was clearly not a person who was objectively trying to understand Ellen White. He already had thrown her out completely and um, was looking for evidence. Our, his understanding of, of health, for living, for instance, is rather clear from something that he said one time. I was in a Sabbath school where he was present, and some discussion about Ellen White, and he raised his hand and he said, well, maybe we probably needed health reform then, but now we have medicine, we don't need it. <laughs> one, of the medic one of the very prominent medical students, he immediately said, no, that's wrong. Healthful living comes first, and then medicine. That what Ron Number said is kind of like if I said, well, you know, I used to take good care of my car. I used to change the oil and, you know, keep it, keep it maintained. But now I have a good mechanic who can fix it when it falls apart. I don't need to worry about those things. Well, obviously that's a very shallow understanding of this whole subject. <coughs> but anyway, he, he just, I see kind of two parts of what he writes about. One is a, is a historian's picture of medicine, medical practice in Ellen White's time in the 1800s. The other is evaluating Ellen White um, as to whether she was right. Now the first part is, is a historian's task, and I thought he did that um, reasonably well. Um, the, the second part, he's really trying to think like a scientist, testing hypotheses. Does Ellen White know what she's doing? And her, his, his history was, with some ex glaring exceptions, was fairly just objective. The other part, he didn't understand um, testing hypotheses. <clears throat> but anyway, start with the, the medical practice in the 1800s. Um, there was no understanding of germs. When were germs first recognized? In the mid-1800s. Um, there was no understanding. Uh, um, I could go through this example, but I probably won't. But there's Ignaz Simmelweis. He, he, he finally died of desperation because he had ways, he had found ways to reduce the, the, the frightful death rate in mothers, in new mothers. It involved just washing your hands, doctors washing their hands. Because he saw evidence of things being carried from the autopsies they did to the living mothers. Can you imagine it? And there was so much objection to his washing and washing and washing that he was, lost his job and finally died of, of just, just memory of, of the cries of the dying mothers. Well, anyway, no understanding of germs, whatever. The drugs, I've heard criticism of her by what she says about drugs. Well, she wasn't talking about drugs as we know them. The drugs in that day were extreme, useless, and often poisons. Strychnine and, and other things of, of equivalent thing. Le Bloodletting. Uh, perhaps George Washington died from their letting the blood, blood bleeding him. Okay, so that was what medicine was like back then. <clears throat> Somewhere I, I've read a um, uh, history of medicine saying that in about 1915, medicine passed a turning point where after that, if you went to a doctor, it was more likely to make, get you well rather than more likely to kill you. So she was writing before that turning point. <clears throat> okay. Health reformers, the, the, the response to this, people were realizing something was wrong with, med with what's going on in medicine. So there were a number of health reformers who began working in the 1830s. Um, so there was this, this active health reform movement long before Ellen White wrote on the subject. Some of Ellen White's health principles are found in the writings of others. She even uses similar wording, um, and she makes incorrect statements about health. She didn't follow her own advice very well. She was a part-time meat eater until 1894. So, you know, a lot of problems here. Well, <clears throat> numbers as conclusions are, are like this. The main outlines of the Edmunds health message were in place before Ellen White had her health vision in 1863. So is that true? She copied her ideas from other reformers rather than getting them by inspiration. Problems in his design. <clears throat> well, he began with the rejection of divine inspiration right from the beginning. Uh, she showed similarities, that is, these two circles. There's, take, this is Ellen White's ideas. Um, here are other reformers' ideas. Okay, there was some overlap. Uh, Ron Numbers talks about the area of overlap. He does not 
deal with these areas. So he did not give an objective analysis. And he uses anecdotal data, no quantitative data. Okay, so my neighbor, um, you know, he, he lived a very healthful life, but he, uh, he died of a heart attack in his 40s. Okay, then my Uncle Joe, he ate and drank and whatever, uh, you know, you want to think of, and he lived to be 90. That's, okay, you take those two examples, does that demonstrate anything? No, some people are very strong, no matter how they abuse themselves. Others are physiologically weak. You've got to look at a whole population and, and get the whole picture, and he never does that. He relies on, on quantitative, on no quantitative data, anecdotal data. He relies on unsupported insinuations, and he failed to provide the data that could support his claims. <clears throat> so he wrote as if her ideas and other people's were almost the same, which is clearly not the case. He didn't look at it this way. Okay, so he, he provided a good summary of the history, where Ellen White fit in. When he dealt with the hypothesis, Ellen White's health principles did not come by divine inspiration. He doesn't have the data. That's where he, he really doesn't understand what he's talking about. So what would be needed? <clears throat> here's what I, here's what I, the story that I gave to when I went to see, uh, I forget his name, but at the Ellen White um, Center. List all health principles used by White and other reformers. Score them all as correct or incorrect as understood by modern medical sciences. So you, you determine um, how many correct and incorrect are used by Ellen White and by other reformers. Now that's not an, an absolute standard because medical scientists are not perfect. But there has been a lot of increase, improvement in our understanding of health. And so that would at least give a, a good comparison that would say a lot about how to answer this question. Okay, Don McMahon, then this physician, and this energetic, enthusiastic physician from, from Australia, he had a lot of questions he wanted answers for. And so he did very extensive research uh, reading um, Ellen White's writings and other health reformers and noting every uh, helpful principle and reasons for them and then comparing. And he had done a lot of study and written papers that he used in giving talks on healthful living. So he had a good uh, picture of, of what, was, what was what. And then he scored these <coughs> um, verified, meaning modern science has shown they're right. And he has them in two categories verified with significant, that is, major effects. He was not talking about statistics here, just being having major effects, or verified with minor effects, or unverified. And so he did, he applied this the same way to Ellen White and to all these others. <coughs> okay, here's what Ellen White said. She didn't read the other reformers until she reported in the, uh, the 1863 Health Vision and spiritual gifts. She wrote that in 1864. Then she says she read other health reform books and found them uh, and used some of the, she found them, there were a lot of similarity and she used them. Then later on, uh, early 1900, she published um, Ministry of Healing. Okay. McMahon outlines three possibilities to consider. One, she was deluded. She really didn't have a clue. Two, she copied all of her health principles. Or three, there was divine inspiration. Okay, what would you expect from these? If she was deluded, her first writings would be um, probably nonsense, and then they might improve as she read other people's. Or if she copied it all, then you'd expect to be her, her you'd expect her first writings to be about the same level of, of quality of correctness as the others. And she would likely improve if they improved. Or divine inspiration, you would think that uh, her first writings would be the most accurate. And it would go down somewhat if she did what she says she did, she read the others then after her first uh, writing her first vision. So let's see what the data have to say. <clears throat> These are his quantitative data. Okay, the first thing she wrote after her vision was spiritual gifts. And then here are things that she brought into it after that. And here's the Ministry of Healing in 1905. Okay. Four percent, that is two of her statements, were, were, are not verified by science. 
So that doesn't mean they're, they're goofy or wrong. They just have not been demonstrated by science. All the rest uh, has been verified by modern science. Later in the things that she, some of the things she wrote, she, she used some material from the, these other authors and she wasn't quite as accurate. Ministry of Healing, she comes back up a bit. She has only 13% that are not verified by modern science. So let's compare this with the other reformers. Did she get this from them? Well, here are, are some of those people, Graham, Alcott, Coles, Jackson, those are uh, some that she's known to have read, the primary ones. Then her book, Spiritual Gifts, Ministry of Healing. Okay, these other ones, they, their unfair, unverified principles in their books are, you know, 50, 60, 65 percent. Most of what they wrote is, is known to be wrong. Compare that to Ellen White. Very different level of, of quality, even with when she dropped down a bit here in Ministry of Healing. Still a, a glaring difference between those. <coughs> Why's her explanations, now those come out a little different, and we're going to talk about that later. She isn't that, that accurate on her physiological explanations. The, the principles we're talking about would be things like drink lots of water, um, get a lot of fresh air, don't eat, don't smoke. Okay, those are principles, things to do. The physiological explanations would be describing why those matter. Okay, we'll come back to this in a minute. Now, okay, compare directly. <clears throat> Here's what Jackson did, 58% wrong. Uh, the things, the concepts that are in both Ellen White and Jackson, they have a, a high level of, uh, of um, quality. In other words, she, the things that she wrote that are similar are all very high quality. The things that Jackson wrote that are not in Ellen White, okay, they're, they really are bad. The things that are in, in uh, spiritual gifts, not in Jackson, she's 100% verified. Okay, so there's a, she obviously was not copying from these others. Because uh, if, if she was, why is there such a dramatic difference in the accuracy of her writing, of her work, and the others? Um, Kellogg. Um, John Harvey Kellogg. Raw numbers here, in, in, he indicates, he states, that he must have had a lot of influence on her and uh, had a lot of influence on what she wrote and a, you know, a lot of copying from, from Kellogg. Well, what's the truth? Kellogg was really no more accurate than the others, even though he had a high quality medical education. Um, in Ministry of Healing, the, the one where she is not as accurate as earlier, she's still dramatically different from him. And what Ron Numbers doesn't mention is that Kellogg, that, that almost all of the, the principles that Ellen White had, had described had been published before Kellogg even started medical school. Okay, so that's a place where, where Numbers was pretty far off in his history. All right, so we got these verified and unheld verified principles. Let's just look at some of the unverified ones of these other, off, other reformers. Um, let's see what we've got here. Graham, for health we should go naked. We should avoid strong <laughs> smells, even flowers. We should not use salt. If meat is to be eaten, it should be eaten raw. It is best not to drink water at all. Get water only from fruit. Now Graham, bragged at one point that he had not drunk any water for six months. That was shortly before he died. <laughs> Probably from dehydration. Um, Alcott, protecting the face or neck from in the sub-zero weather is a health hazard. Uh, having a short nap during the day is a health risk. Two people should not sleep in the same bed. Most vegetables except potatoes are not good for health. Fat should be the main part of the meat we eat. Children should not eat fruit. Okay. Do these guys sound like they know what they're doing? Um, <laughs> coals, we should know our own phrenology. That is the bumps on our head. Some vegetables are unsuitable for, to eat, like cucumbers. Babies should not be nursed at night. Uh, no, you, no need to, bar, to bathe more than once or twice a week. This was a common theme in a lot of these. You don't need to bathe much. Uh, vaccinations are not needed. Marital sexual activity is dangerous to health. Potatoes are not good food for children, et cetera. You know, this goes on and on. Uh, Kellogg, sex should not exceed once per month. 
Uh, the oldest age for sex should be menopause for women and 50 years for men. You can see there's some things he had a bit of a hang up on. For pre-puberty, pre-puberty girls, it's good for their health to be, do a surgical circumcision. Um, flannel, flannel neck to ankle underclothes should be worn all year round. Well, okay, that's Kellogg. Um, okay, how about Ellen White? How does she compare? Here are the unverified what's in her writing. Spiritual gifts, avoid leaven in bread, usually eat only two meals a day. Now people will differ how they think about these, but they're not gonna hurt you if you do these things. Uh, those are rather minor issues. In the ministry of feeling, she has more, avoid fruits and vegetables in the same meal. There's argument about that. Cheese is unfit for food. Now remember, she's writing the 1800s. Uh, things were a whole lot different then than now. Don't eat blood. Okay, why does he, put this in here as unverified. <clears throat> well, there are a lot of reasons one can think of for not eating blood, but he couldn't find actual medical demonstration that it will hurt your health. And so he, in other words, he's being very rigorous on her as well as the others in, in what he calls verified. Um, okay, these last few are, are, are known to slow down digestion. It's just a matter of opinion. Okay, was that, could you say that is medically wrong or what? But she doesn't have any of those kooky ideas that the others have. And so, why is that? <clears throat> Let's come back to these whys. Physiological reasons why you should do things. She's not really um, more accurate than the others. And let's go, I think, the next slide here. Um, what's at the top, the principles and the whys? Again, you know, she's not, not different. Okay, what do we make of that? <clears throat> um, the what's, white is far more accurate in these principles than the others. Um, her what's were not available from any human source at any time during her lifetime. That is many of, most of them. Okay, what's the explanation for that? Certainly divine inspiration is an explanation. Does anybody have another explanation? They were not available from any human source any time during her lifetime. Her why's, her explanations, they were not significantly more accurate than others. And I would suggest God gave us the principles of health and left it for us to figure out the reasons why. This is, a, I, to me, this is hard evidence on the nature of inspiration. God doesn't tell us everything. He gives us the principles on, of, how, of um, how we should live. If we have to have all the explanations before we follow them, we probably won't follow them. Um, the, the other reason is, if. She, if she had written what we would recognize as valid explanation, physiological explanations, the people in her day would have thought she's crazy. They were not prepared to understand these things at all, and so um, she was just left to figure those out for herself. Why so much vigor in arguments against White's inspiration? Well, misunderstanding what she said, and this is often the case, um, perhaps because she says things that people don't want to follow, or believe, like health principles. Uh, I know some people throw her out because they don't like her ideas about creation. If Ellen G. White contains communication from God, it's gonna challenge some entire world views. And so there are reasons why people don't like what she says. There's just a few comments on the, her critics today, and I'll say a lot of things about what she says about sex, and they think she's really off the wall. Um, numbers makes this insinuation, white would recommend sex once a month. Okay, well where does she say that? She doesn't say that anywhere. Nowhere does she even imply that. He, he t this is just an insinuation he throws out because other health reformers said this. Did she agree? Statements, see there are a lot of statements in her writing about lustful passions, animal passions, or husbands worse than brutes, okay. Does that mean she doesn't like sex? Well, let's consider that. Um, I, I've, in the book, there's a, there are two lists of things that I have, and I don't think we have time to go through all of those lists, but one list you, you can find, and she doesn't give them as a list. You have to study and, and find them. This, in places where she's describing relationships where true love governs a husband, and there's nothing negative about sex in those. Uh, it's, it's all positive. And then descriptions where she, that are connected with her terms, animal passions, etc. 
where she's putting these together and describing the relationships, it seems clear to me she's not describing a healthy, uh, a married couple relationship. She's talking about situations where you have a very uh, self-centered, abusive husband, maybe even actual abusive behavior. So that's um, people who try to say that she was against uh, sex from these, they have not read carefully. Um, and, and maybe even a better, a better answer for this comes from the fact that some Adventists and others advocated that those who wish to be holy must refrain from sex except to have children. So if she thought the way Ron Numbers tries to say that she thought, she ought to be uh, you know, um, supporting those and, and um, applauding them. What she do? Exactly the opposite. Um, she, she fought against these people who were pushing these things. She said, this is not from God. It's going to bring real serious problems in a relationship. It'll bring you know, um, moral, moral problems. And one interesting uh, example. There's this man, Edmund's man, wrote a little pamphlet advocating that you know, no sex except to have babies. And he determined to get her to, to support him with this pamphlet. He tried to make appointments and she wouldn't, she ignored him. She would not talk to him. Finally, she, she gave in and said, okay, she'll interview him. So he came, told his ideas. All she said at the end was, go home and be a man. <laughs> Fortunately, in this case, he took the hint and he didn't publish his, his little booklet. <clears throat> and here's a statement that I think kind of sums it, sums her idea about, about sexual relationships and marriage. She had a lot of things to say against immoral relationships, but within marriage. And just one phrase here. At that time, this phrase family relationship, that was referring to sexual intercourse. Jesus did not enforce celibacy on any class of men. He came not to destroy the sacred relationship of marriage, but to exalt it and restore it to its original sanctity. He looks with pleasure upon the family relationship where sacred and unselfish love bears sway. Would any of the women here object to this kind of a relationship? Um, okay, so that's, in a nutshell, what uh, I, my fi our findings about her. Any questions? The book? Well, it's uh, published by Pacific Press. Let's see, this is 2000. Six, I think it was. I don't know. 2005, The Prophet and Her Critics, available from Pacific Press. Um, myself and Don McMahon. I, and I did most of the first, I did the first part uh, in analyzing these people. McMahon did the, the original research. Uh, pardon? Oh, you should be able to get it from the order from the ABC or from Amazon. I, yeah, I, it was there. I haven't looked recently, but it should be. Yeah. It was there uh, last I Googled it. Okay. For what it's worth is uh, one other thing, and that is McMahon has a book of his own right. that has all of his arguments in greater detail than what's mm -hmm. in that book. Yeah. And it's a great companion to it, and it even has a CD with all of the statements of Ellen White mm -hmm. and all of the statements of the reformers and, and uh, references to how he judged which ones were uh, one. verified and unverified. Yeah. The detailed description of his research. And he, he reports it in a way that anybody could go back and check out his, his um, things he's talking about and see if they agree. <coughs> and uh, let me say one more thing. Um, a friend of Don McMahon's sent Ron Numbers. I think first McMahon's book and then our joint book. And in each case, Numbers' response was about a paragraph. N no new information, no objective statements, just a, a lashing out at us. That's all. Yeah. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brand. I think this information is extremely useful. Unfortunately, most of us, including myself, I didn't know this. You had written such a wonderful book. You have answered my queries about this topic for many years because I grew up 
with the number one hypothesis. <laughs> and I refused to jump to uh, number four. So I think this is the best explanation I ever heard. I'm going to have to buy your book. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you cover the whole area. There's only one question that I think you failed to address. Just one. And <laughs> just one. Where would you, because uh, you had a long list of unverified prediction health principles that are still not verified, I would like to know where would you place the, what Ellen G. White borrowed apparently from her husband, the terrible, the terrible diseases resulting from solitary vice. Yeah. In other words, the idea is, if you do it your wife, it's healthy, wonderful. Mm -hmm. If you do it yourself, you're going to die of terrible diseases, some of them dyspepsia, spinal complaint, headache, epilepsy, impaired eyesight, palpitation of the heart, pain in the side, bleeding in the lungs, spasm of the heart and lungs, diabetes or incontinent or urine, flu uh, fluor albus, I don't know what that is, inflammation, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, she did not copy verbatim from her husband, but I could read what she she has a long list, similar yeah. list. So but my question is, I'm not questioning mm -hmm. the accuracy of what she said. Mm -hmm. I'm questioning since it's not verified and uh -huh. the medical profession in general tends to negate <coughs> or at least suggest that it is an exaggeration mm -hmm. of the, what actually happens. Yeah. Then my question is, where would you place this among unverified, or would you place this among those that are true mm -hmm. but will be verified in the near future? Well, I, I discussed it in here, but let me briefly talk about it. Um, actually, your, your last question, where would I place it? I don't think we have the information to decide. Um, she <coughs> she um, doesn't have accurate whys, and maybe that's one of these. Maybe this is just God didn't give her the reasons. That's one possibility. There are other possibilities. What? Um, okay, th there are attitudes, and, you know, our, our mental attitudes and our emotions can affect our health, our physical health. So, is it possible that the the, the powerful emotions in, in a sexual relationship, when it's when it's misused and, and misdirected? in a very selfish way, could it have those, have an influence in, in weakening us for those other things? That's another thing to think about. How would you know? I think you'd need a massive survey of the, of the nature of the Adventist Health Study and assume people would give honest answers before you'd even know that. I don't think anybody's doing that kind of research. Okay, that's a good answer. A follow-up uh, would be what do you do with a soldier who is away from his wife for a long extended, ex mm -hmm. extended period of time? Mm -hmm. And he is tempted to do what other soldiers do, mm -hmm. which well, uh, find the... I won't try to answer that. I'm not a... <laughs> that's not my field. Um, I, I will say, I've looked through what she says about this. When she get, where she talks about examples of people, and... I, it's clear to me she's not talking about somebody who makes some mistakes. She's talking about a lifelong habit, even during marriage. Those are the examples she gives. And it, I was at, there's one comment I heard somebody make, and I, you know, this is just what I heard. I couldn't verify it. I was at a talk on this topic, and a lady came up and talked afterwards with, with um, whoever had been talking, that um, she worked for some years at a jail. And, and these men, there's all these men in there. They had nothing to do all day. So they spend their day masturbating. Okay, so uh, and said, she said the, the, the health authorities who would sort of oversee the jail, they talked to her about what's going on in that jail, the, the extremely high rate of cancer in that jail. And she was just asking, okay, could there be a connection? Who knows? It's up for you to, to answer. <laughs> 
You had a question here? Uh, oh, I did. Yeah, you will. Yeah, I don't worry. Okay, whoever. Um, uh, I have three points if I can get around to any of them. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm always amazed to see so many of Ellen White's critics somehow use her as justification for claiming that she was against sex. And my simple argument with them is, what is wrong with your thinking here? Do you think that her kids came up from the cabbage patch? I mean, what? Well, she must have had, what, sex three times? Or oh, jeez. Anyway, I so. mean, this is, uh, I mean, how do these people come up with this, these kinds of mm -hmm. ideas? It's, it's like an obsession with, with the subject. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Second point. Uh, when we talk to our children when, when they're very young, we tend to, uh, how should I say, be instructive in a more directive way and less in a, in a long explanatory manner. Mm -hmm. For example, I, as far as I remember, when we were trying to train mm -hmm, our little Timothy to use the potty, we just showed him the potty and says, this is where you sit when you need to go. You don't just go all over the place, you know. Uh, it wasn't, oh, but why? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's assemble a committee and discuss this. Uh, and so you see, uh, we tend to be somehow focused on the what and how to accomplish the what's. And not so much about all of the many reasons why the what may be important. Mm -hmm. uh, could, could this simple approach perhaps uh, help us understand why uh, Sister White's, uh, how should I say, um, strength in the what's is more so than in the wise, mm -hmm. because God's directives were aimed to guide us into doing the right thing, not, not just mm -hmm. wander about. Yeah. The third thing, my son has now just finished grade 11, and he has had to write numerous essays and submit them online to his teachers. And the interesting thing is the teachers are all preoccupied with plagiarism. Mm -hmm. And so there is, an, when you're submitting your thing online, there is a program that automatically checks it for plagiarism. All the things that have been written by someone else are suddenly highlighted. And so he submits this essay, and I know what he had to read. And he submits this thing, and suddenly about 30% of it is highlighted as having come from some book or some writing someplace at the other end of the world. And I say, how's this possible? He says, I never heard of this guy. And how's this po you know so you explain to me now how is it possible that the kid who obviously avoids reading many books before writing <laughs> the essay <laughs> ends up being guilty of plagiarism so, of a book he's never read so what was your he's never even heard of based on what you've presented so on Go ahead. yeah Hi. thanks a lot well, i just want to well, catch him before well, he leaves. well I was here when Ron Numbers was here. Yeah. And based on what you've presented and so on, I'm a little bit surprised how revered he is mm -hmm. by some people on the faculty here. I was really a little bit surprised. Yeah. Well, maybe some people may agree with him. Yeah, I agree. And I don't, I don't think they've comment. carefully evaluated no, what he's doing. I'm going to get your book and read it now, but uh, I was, re I mean, it was differential. Mm -hmm. he, like he was. So mm -hmm. special. Person. Yeah. 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 And I was a little bit surprised about that. There was yeah. very little. Well, he's written some good historical things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think he's, he's 
is capable of very good history research. There was not a level of objectivity here in this book. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, um, Dr. Brand, thanks so much. This is uh, just—it's a good discussion, and I don't know if you've uh, uh, had the frustration that I have had in in, in reading Ellen's White writing is that she uh, does not really clarify when it is inspired and when it's just her opinion. I mean, you re re you showing the whys that that uh, she's not successful on indicates that there's a lot of stuff that's just her opinion and uh, uh, you know based on her judgment of what she knows and and, and uh, but we we uh, how do we know if it's inspired or not she doesn't clarify whether it is, if it's from 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 directly from God or, or, or not and and uh, so it's it, you know it, it's easy to to, to to uh, just uh, accept things she says is from God when really it's just her opinion. I mean, even, even Paul uh, made sure that he was clarify, clarified in some ways. Like in 1 Corinthians, he writes, now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. At least at some places, he clarified that this is not from God, this is my opinion. Um, but Ellen White doesn't do that. And I don't understand why. I just wondered if you had some comments on that. Well, I think the only way to, to deal with that is each one we personally read and study and pray and compare with reality. And, uh, you know, we can get a, an idea of where, where to go with that. Um, I find her things uh, amazingly accurate. Um, we, uh, and you can tell that, uh, in fact, um, McMahon points out that, that the, the whys, you know, what, what a lot of people criticize her, say she says wrong things medically. That's typically they're referring to the whys, not the whats. And they're not recognizing the difference. And she knew the difference. Clearly she knew the difference. She says, I, I have been, um, you know, I use some salt because I've been shown by God that it's important. Whereas other reformers would say, don't eat salt. She said, the wheres and why for, whys and wherefores I do not know. So she, she did say, clarify that she, she did not know the whys. And so there are places where she does clarify that. Um, and we, we could just have to evaluate individually what we think about the rest of it. I think I have a possible answer for uh, my brother's uh, question. How can a person be honest in saying, I did not borrow this, and yet having borrowed? An anecdote, uh, many years ago, I was asleep and woke up with a very brilliant idea. And I thought that it was very important, so I got up and went to my desk and wrote it, the entire paragraph. And I could s have sworn that I did not borrow this from anybody and then a few days later, by accident, I opened a book by Ellen G. White, and I was surprised to see the paragraph I had written underlined in my book. <laughs> so this is possible. You can read your, I mean, your mind plays tricks on you. And you, you can honestly believe you did not borrow. This is why your idea. So now I'm afraid to claim anything when I write. Mm -hmm. Because I may have borrowed from somebody and I believe it's my own idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. The yeah. mind works in amazing ways. Um, I read a book called Blink. I'll uh, just be right with you. And it's an interesting book, and the guy starts off telling about a statue that was purchased by the um, big museum here in L.A., um, Getty, the Getty. It was, a, it was of a certain type of statue that was commonly made back at a certain era in history. And they bought, they spent millions for this one that was seemed to be really exceptional. So they had a number of experts come and look at it. <coughs> and they, the typical response was, yeah, it's really good, but something isn't right. 
None of them could tell what was not right. But the something was not right. It was only after a lot of study and research by experts that they figured out it was just too good. They, they, it was, there's some, they did figure out what was wrong. It was a fake. But, and so pe we can recognize things it, you know, that we don't, cannot consciously define. Our mind is, is, <laughs> is chewing on these things all the time. And so. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, that you would expect her first writings to be most accurate uh, in, in terms of inspiration. So I was wondering, uh, you know, in, in 1849, she wrote about this mysterious knocking in New York. And she writes specifically in early writings, I saw that the mysterious knocking in New York and other places was the power of Satan. And what she's referring to, and everybody recognized, she was talking about the Fox sisters and, and their reporting of the knocking uh, in New York State uh, in 1848, a year before. And, uh, um, but years later, uh, the Fox sisters admitted it was all a hoax. They had taught themselves as young children to you know, snap their toes and their fingers in a way that it would sound like a loud knock. And they admitted it was, uh, this is how they, this, this is, was the origin of the knocking. It wasn't from some spiritual entity out there uh, creating the knocks. But here was Ellen White saying that it's the power of Satan. Mm -hmm. And obviously that has to be interpreted as an inspired statement. Okay, the second book you talked about, The Source, how do we know that's correct? Which one? The one that says it was not spiritual. How do it's, we know it, that's It correct? was published in, in, the, in the New York uh, uh, newspaper that where they uh, admitted in, in, under uh, oath, and she gave a presentation showing and demonstrating how they went about uh, uh, creating the knocking sound. They admitted it before a huge audience and demonstrated that this is the way it was done. And this was, uh, and, and, and so, and they wrote, uh, pub in a public document that it was all a hoax. They admitted it was. And, uh, but, but Ellen... Lying. No, they... Uh, uh, how would you know somebody is deaf? Yeah, but that's they, that's but kind of they demonstrated, they demonstrated exactly how it was done. But here's Ellen White saying it was the power of Satan. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it could easily be, um, uh, recognize that the, the, uh, the Fox sisters had a you know, huge influence on spiritualism from then on. And so the power of Satan was accomplished. But here was her chance to expose something and, she, uh, 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 and really make a clear understanding of what was going on to, mm -hmm. to, to show that this was a hoax. Mm -hmm. And she, she uh, doesn't, doesn't yeah. do that. So well, I'm not, I'm not understanding. Yeah. This is a complex issue. Uh, yeah, maybe they had some techniques worked out. Was the devil involved as well? Um, well, that's, that's her point. point. But her it sheds light on inspiration on what, I mean, she gives, she, she gives no clue that it's a hoax. She doesn't well, how do we, I don't think we really know whether it is well, or not. I, I think it's as clear, it's very well published that they okay. admitted it was a hoax. Do we, do we believe everything in the, you know, well, never mind. Let's go on. <laughs> Ariel. Actually, we have two more and then Ariel. Okay. Um, in, terms, in terms of her why, it would be a real challenge in light of the scientific information available in her time to describe accurately what we know at this time and make any sense at all in answering the why. She doesn't have the vocabulary and the data to make those kind of answers to, as to why that would fit right. with today's data. I don't know how they do that. Mm -hmm. and, and all of us in medicine know that the answers we learned in medical school are changed by the time we're in practice and they'll be different by the mm -hmm. time I'm retired. So I don't know how she would have given the why mm -hmm. with accuracy for today. Because mm -hmm. it'll be different 20 years from now. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's one comment on that. And also, okay, there's that part where sh she could not give it but then on the, on, the, on the what's, she had information not available from any human source any time during her lifetime. So that's clear, clearly different from the why's. 
Okay. I just wanted to make a, a quick statement about the Fox sisters reporting. Only one of them said that they that they made it all up, and she conveniently waited until the other sister was dead because the other sister would not back off on their original <laughs> story. Yeah. Uh, seems to me that if these Fox sisters were making this up and fooling the public, uh, this is certainly in the realm of the power of Satan. Uh, and so, uh, regardless of how it was done, yeah. it wasn't good. Mm -hmm. And it did apparently have an influence on developing spiritualism. So that's, um, yeah. Back probably 10 years ago, I was given a manuscript of the Desire of Ages that from Don Mansell that used to work at the White Estate mm -hmm. or whatever. And it was on a study on all that, whether it was borrowed or not or mm -hmm. whatever. And to read that, it's just like, it's amazing. She is just so much trying to get across how fabulous God is, mm -hmm. how wonderful God is. And because she uses one, you know, just it's the same way. There's just a couple little things about the Bible, like quotes from the Bible. Well, the Bible, can't we quote it too? Or can't we say the same type of words? It, it was just mm -hmm. like, I don't know how anybody could be not drawn to God because of this. Is this something that she's trying to um, make herself important because um, she's written all these books? No, she's trying to just show people how fabulous her mm -hmm. God is. So. Mm -hmm. um. Much is made about why Sister White would spend so much effort in the whys when she wasn't actually told by God why. The reason is very simple. When you tell your children to do something, what's their first answer? Why? <laughs> and now what do you say? <laughs> well, how long does that work? <laughs> do, do you see where this is going? So she provides an answer that to her seems obvious at the time and that seems satisfactory to everybody who keeps demanding it. If we were more sincere to know God's will, we wouldn't be immediately jumping to this, ah, why? You know, when I tell my son, make your bed, and he says, why? <laughs> when he'll have to get back into it anyhow at the end of the day. Yeah, you, you, you kind of see his rationale, but you also see the other rationale. You know what I'm saying? So you make a reasonable argument to support the cause, but that does not necessarily hold water for all eternity. At some point, we hopefully get wiser and know deeper, and thus we'll have a more correct explanation. Mm -hmm. This, how science moves on, that's an, a very important point, point that a lot of people don't really think about. I have some theologian friends who base their theology on scientific, current scientific concepts what science currently believes. And often they're even out of date. They don't know that that was, that it, that was no longer true anymore. It was, was true maybe 10 years ago. And so science keeps moving as it learns more and more. I tell my students sometimes, half of what we're teaching you is wrong. Okay, why? Because we won't know which is right until science moves on and learns more. So science keeps moving, a, a theologian or other whoever else, at a given point here, determines to, you have to understand the Bible this way because this is what science says. Science keeps moving, pretty soon they're sitting uh, with nothing, with no foundation, sitting on shifting sand, okay? We, that doesn't work. Um, if the Bible is not reliable and a trustworthy foundation, then we have nothing to stand on. <laughs> science is gonna leave us sitting in the mud, one mud, mud puddle. Such a fertile area of discussion. Uh, several points that I've heard along the way. Number one, I agree with your son, therefore you are wrong. <laughs> Number two, uh, 
in, in, when I was in England, I did a study on the Shakers and Mother Anne. And an inter interesting item came out of the research. Her celibate village in, in New England began to be visited by prominent figures, important people, Indian chiefs, deceased, of course, but they began to visit and play with the children and thus won the interest of the parents. This continued for a few years and then the visitants announced that they would no longer be coming, that they were going out into every village and hamlet in America. And it was at the time of the Fox sisters, so this correlates with the beginning of apparent spiritualism in religion in the United States, that the movement began in that milieu. A third point, I was present with a group of European leaders brought to the United States to expose them to the history of Ellen White, and we went around to all the sites, and, and then we had discussion afterwards with Arthur White himself. And the subject of having sexual relations on the Sabbath came up. They asked Elder White, what should they do about that? And you'll have to look at me now to see his response. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> so I still don't know what's right. <laughs> Talking about uh, speaking under oath, uh, we know of a very famous gentleman who says, I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> um, on a more serious note, Dr. Brand, thank you so much. Yeah. We need more of, more of this. Um, one, could read ten, one could read ten different authors, and I think all of us here could pick up this is Ellen White. Mm -hmm. This is important. My concern, even coming to church, I was driving and I was thinking, <laughs> the ones of us who care, the church in this country is falling apart because our schools are closing. You want to destroy a church, you destroy the schools. And uh, I travel a lot. And places are growing like leaps and bounds. Today, our kids do not know what book Great Controversy is. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't know who Ellen White is. Our pastors make fun of Ellen White from the pulpit. And it is sad mm -hmm. in a place like this, so many professors do not forget we live in Ellen White, but uh, do not give credence in what she had to say. It is very, very sad. Is this going to fall apart? I do not think so. But some miracles need to happen. You know, uh, uh, Kila came and spoke to 7,000 Mormons, and they still stay with their hand principles. They're thriving. Um, uh, what is happening to us? Uh, it's time for us to define ourselves, who we are, and where we came from, and where we are going. <coughs> There's a question in the middle there. Here, I'm you. Yeah, uh, it seems to me that uh, a basic question we need to ask here, more basic, is this approach of uh, some historians and so on of not using divine inspiration in the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, intellectually, I don't know how you can defend that position. What if in, uh, divine inspiration exists? Mm -hmm. Can you claim you're arriving at truth when you exclude, arbitrarily exclude certain concepts? Uh, it seems to me this is a very dangerous position to take if you're, if you're looking for truth. Yeah. Well, in, in molecular biology, or well, to any two, uh, any biologists, 
the question of how did life begin? Exactly. If you're in most, well, <coughs> science has an answer that is clearly portrayed in all of its, in, in its publications and everywhere. <laughs> life began by a chance process through millions of years, molecules bumping into each other. And um, okay, what is the evidence for that? Zero. So why does science hang on to it? Mm -hmm. Because you, you, if you're going to believe the philosophy of naturalism, you have to. If we admit that, the, that there may require a divine action or intelligent design to make life, then the philosophy of naturalism is dead. You know, it, it's all gone. And most of science is not willing to ever see that happen. So you have to. The, the, the nature of life and how it could begin is the elephant in the room. You cannot admit it, but it's right there in front of you. If, if you know molecular biology and biochemistry. I, I would just add to one comment. A recent Pew Research survey says that 51% of scientists believe in either divine, some kind of divinity, or in God, when the majority, and albeit a very slight majority, when the majority of scientists believe in this, and the scientific literature will not allow that concept. We're dealing with sociological phenomena here. We're not dealing with an open search for truth. Not dealing with science. <coughs> yeah. Uh, Ellen White wrote several books. There are also several books attributed to her which she didn't write, which are compilations of mm -hmm writings, particularly councils on diet and foods. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that. I'm, I'm a little leery of some of these compilation mm -hmm. books where things may have been taken out of context. Yeah. Well, I, I can just give my opinion, and I'm 100% with you. I, there, you can have a paragraph taken out of context. It can mean something very different than what it looks like when it's there by itself. And I, I have problems with a lot of that. I have a comment, but I would like to oh. yield to him because I already oh. made several oh, comments. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I just was wondering why science, you know, it seems like it, as you're t explaining, it seems to have to be all or nothing. I mean, what's wrong with just saying we don't really know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, is that so bad? It, if that's the truth, then yeah. the truth is better than some kind of... Yeah. Uh, deluding people into thinking, well, we know everything. Yeah. Well, there I mean, are a know. few. There are a few scientists, including some very prominent ones, who, who very frankly say, we don't. We don't have an idea how life began. We don't have a clue. It's a mystery how ev evolution of all these kinds of organisms could have happened. They're still evolutionists, but they're honest. And there are, unfortunately, kind of the the textbook orthodoxy doesn't accept that approach. Yeah, just be honest. It's refreshing to be honest. Mm -hmm. I have two, uh, two comments. First one, sex on the Sabbath. I'm tempted to share it's a my of opinion. I'm tempted <laughs> to share what the Lord has revealed to me throughout the years. <laughs> yes, definitely. There is something in the Bible. It's not definitive, but uh, in the case of a doubt, it's better to be on the safe side. When the Lord was ready to declare, to speak to the children of Israel and give them the Ten Commandments in a loud voice. What did he say? He say, stay away from women. <laughs> and the Apostle Paul said, do not defraud each other except for a devotion to God, a few days or whatever devotion to God. Now the other comment I want to make is regarding Satan's working today. This morning I heard a sermon by a former student of mine. I know him and I know he's truthful. He said that a few years ago he was giving a Bible study to a man who wanted to be baptized and for some reason he was hesitant to approve his request for baptism. So he decided to inquire a few details about his life. He lived off Jesus' revelation to him. 
he claimed that Jesus did reveal to him in advance which patient would come to see him, when he would come, and how much he should charge for the services. And he healed them. Well, in further talking, he discovered that the man claimed that he came with a dead ancestor. He was not alone. He was accompanied by a, somebody who had died some years ago. Immediately, my friend who is a pastor, he said that was a red light. He said, you are following a false Christ. That's not Jesus, that's the devil. So he uh, gave him a study about the state of the dead. The man repented and wanted to be baptized. But his mother said, can I talk to him in private? And he said, uh, she said, if you do that, what are we going to live on? And the man decided not to get baptized. I, I would like to make one point that I think yes. has been missed by all this talk about sex on Sabbath. <laughs> uh, Where do you find it in the Bible? Uh, I will find it in Genesis 2. And if you remember, Adam is made, Eve is made, and it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. What night was that that they first met each other? Friday. Okay. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> one, one thing I think tells us something about how Ellen White thought about it. Issues that are, you know, where we don't really know. Um, she mentions a, a group who are discussing the idea, is there going to be marriage in heaven or new earth or wherever? And, and um, you know, she, she didn't say, the Bible says no. She said, on subject where we know nothing, silence is golden. Yes. Okay. We don't really know, just shut up. 